So it's been about a week or so now since Resident Evil Village first came out, which hopefully has given people enough time to sink their fangs into it and come out on the other end having formed their own impressions. I'm sure if nothing else, it's just created an entirely new fetish for a generation of gamers in nine foot tall vampire MILFs. Are you kidding? And I've already done a video on this one and truthfully I hadn't really planned to do a follow up. Everything I said in that original video still stands and I haven't changed my opinion on it. But there was a lot of stuff that I simply couldn't talk about because of the embargoes. Yeah, embargoes, that's that funny thing where the publisher gives you a bunch of guidelines you have to follow. A list of things you can and cannot talk about, most of what you can't talk about. It's usually a really extensive list to make sure you don't give anything away in your video, which makes it even the more frustrating when you still get people accusing you of spoiling the game. Seriously? So I thought I might go back in now and talk about all of the stuff that I couldn't before, primarily some aspects with the story and the pacing, the puzzles, and one very specific section towards the end of the game, which I found about as enjoyable as bobbing for apples in a urinal. I guess I owe you an explanation. Obviously, if you haven't played or finished Village at this point, well, you should probably avoid this video like it's a portaloo at a campsite. But if you have and want to hear me be a bit more critical, well, let's enter the survival horror one more time and get into it, shall we? Get ready. Right, so I'll start off with the good. I still think this is a really cool and unique entry in the series. I find the location to be refreshing and interesting. The premise of classical monsters like vampires and werewolves, which still have their origins and explanations rooted in science, feels like it's been woven well into the Resident Evil universe. This can't be! Despite the lack of enemy variety, I still do think these enemies are fun to engage in combat. The lichens move around you in these small packs, they stalk you, they bide their time, often engaging you in larger numbers and waiting for the right moment to strike. Feels like you're getting hunted by wild animals, which is the whole point. Though I can't understand how they have a game about shooting werewolves and didn't include silver bullets as some kind of alternate ammo type. Seriously? The other zombie creatures you take on, those ghoul looking things, are genuinely creepy. Their animation is great in the way they topple over and lose their balance, but they still seem incredibly menacing as they move towards you with murderous intent. In other words, they're cool as shit. It's also something I didn't really give enough credit to in my original video, and that's the animations, particularly those for reloading weapons. Something like Ethan holding onto both the empty magazine and the fresh one when reloading a pistol is kinda cool from a technical standpoint, but it also highlights how he isn't the same babe in the woods we met back in Louisiana. I mean, it's like comparing Ripley in Alien to Ripley in Aliens. Fuck you, you crazy bitch! My boys become efficient at learning how to handle firearms, along with becoming more efficient at losing body parts. <sighs> Bruh. Kind of feel too like Village also knows how far over the top it can go without seeing like it's jumped the shark too much. I mean, look, this is a series that's never really been known for being grounded in reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Especially considering it also gave us action scenes like this. Seriously? About the most over the top it gets in Village is when Heisenberg mutates into a giant junkyard monster with saw blades for arms. Ethan has to fight him driving this little buggy that's got a chainsaw on one side and machine gun slash cannon on the other. That's what I call the and this whole sequence is really grindhouse and kind of feels like more something out of RE7 than RE8. Ah! Despite each Lord getting a pretty brisk amount of time in the center stage, I still do think they're all pretty memorable. Oh, you have something to say? Lady D is just such a cool and enigmatic character, from the motion capture, the voice acting, through to her basic design. Simping aside, she's just a really fascinating antagonist, and I only really started to notice in my later playthroughs how, even though she's constantly chasing after Ethan, she's still trying to maintain that facade of nobility. She never actually runs when chasing him. At most, it could be called a brisk walk, I guess because it's not very ladylike to be seen running. In fact, I'm not even too sure she could run in that dress to begin with. I mean, it looks like it's been sewn on. Is that all? Even when she takes a bullet to the face, she shows off what she could call only minor irritation. Again, I suppose because losing her temper is beneath her stature. You'll be sliced to ribbons. Her entire area is the highlight of the game, feeling a lot more like traditional Resident Evil, and I think it's also why I like Heisenberg's factory. Because again, that place is designed around the idea of slowly unlocking and exploring a singular location. And it just reminds me much more of the traditional gameplay loop from the series. 
Contrast this with Moreau, a giant fish monster that looks like something out of Tasmania, who throws up all over the place and seems to cover every nearby surface in solidified bile. Damn you. It's a varied rogue gallery of freaks, and they've all got these unique abilities, personalities, and backstories. Not bad. Not bad, Jersey. However, it wouldn't really make for an interesting video if all I did was tongue the game's asshole again. And there are a few areas where I think the whole thing starts to lose its way, which prevent it from being one of the best games in the series. And now I can talk about them without those launch day review limitations lingering over my head. Stupid idiot! Right, so one of the first big issues with the game, I think, is definitely its pacing and primarily its super slow opening. It's been a few years now since we've had a main entry in the Resident Evil series, not taking into account the remakes for 2 and 3. So with Resident Evil 8, it makes a bit of sense that they need a bit of time to reunite us with Ethan, Mia, and Chris all over again, which I understand, but man, does this thing go on. What? Why? The prologue has this whole sequence with Ethan and Mia, which kind of shows that their transition into a normal life isn't really going how they'd hoped. Mia then gets gunned down by Chris, who shows up out of nowhere, acting like a complete psycho and not even telling Ethan what's happening, along with kidnapping his daughter, Rose. I said get your hands off her! Ethan, no. And I do find it odd how Chris treats Ethan like a civilian. I think at one point later in the game, he outright calls him one, which is kind of weird when you consider he's talking to the same so-called civilian who managed to take down the entire Baker family with no military training or combat experience. I don't know, man, maybe he's just jealous. I mean, Ethan's able to accomplish more solo in this game than Chris is able to with an entire team of Special Forces soldiers. I gotta say, I'm surprised you made it this far. After this sequence, you've then got to sit through a pretty slow and tedious section as you find yourself stranded in the middle of nowhere. You move through the forest, then you're in a house for a bit before arriving at the village itself and meeting an old man who promptly gets pulled up through the roof in such an inhuman way that it kind of reminds me of the end of Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> You then get the first combat sequence against a never-ending onslaught of lichens, which really does mirror the whole opening to Resident Evil 4, when you first arrive and get attacked by the Ganados. Only this time, instead of Dr. Salvador with a chainsaw, it's old mate with a huge ass hammer. You can't even win this encounter though, it just seems like you need to survive for a set amount of time, then it warps you to a specific area for a cinematic, at which point the whole thing ends. It's probably not helping either that this is really one of the most challenging sections in the entire game. And what's not helping that is that you don't have much ammo, you don't have many healing items, and you don't even really know what you're supposed to be doing. And how can we never see these lichens riding horses for the rest of the game? Imagine how terrifying it would have been having to run away from a bunch of those things. What? Why? Anyway, after that, you're introduced to a whole bunch of other survivors in another extended cinematic, all of whom get killed literally minutes later. Bruh. It almost seems like they're going to be also setting up another side character, but nope, she dies too, falling to her death like an idiot. Now, all of this is fine the first time you play it. In fact, you kind of appreciate the old bait and switch with some of these side characters being killed off as quickly as they're introduced. It heightens the danger of the village, and it also reinforces that you're playing as a one-man army who's not going to be helped along the way. But it is a lot of time spent here introducing us to people who are going to be forgotten in the next 15 minutes. Hey, don't talk like that. I mean, I couldn't even tell you the names of any of these characters. What the hell was that? The main issue, though, is when you're replaying the game, because you have to sit through this 20 or 30 so minute long prologue time and time again. And if you know anything about these games, you know they're all about replaying over and over. Upgrading the guns, unlocking new ones, getting better at rooting out the paths you take, and etc. Stupid idiot! This right here though I think is going to be a big pain in the ass for the multitude of people who are going to invest their time trying to speedrun it. And it almost kind of turned me off replaying the game as well. After I'd finished this thing for the third time, I think, I really started to question if I wanted to go back and replay it again in the first place, just knowing how slow that first part is. What did all this? The other issue is that it unfortunately misrepresents the game because a lot of people are going to be playing this thing for 15 minutes and then just assuming it's a cinematics fest for the remainder of the campaign, and that's just not true. RE7 is also guilty of this as well. The whole prologue to that game was an absolute bore to sit through, and I'd argue that the one in Village is as long, if not longer. What do you mean? Compare this to the start of the second game. You know, you move through the city streets for maybe a couple of minutes, make it to the police station, and then that's it. Now you can play the game. Or even in Resident Evil 4, you had to sit through a few minutes of cinematics as Leon walked into someone's house like a complete idiot, 
But then, that was pretty much it. You got to head off and start suplexing middle-aged peasants. First impressions are, as they say, everything. And I can see how the first impressions here would have pissed off a lot of people. Makes sense. What are you talking about? The monsters? The other section that drags the pacing down even more though is the sequence roughly a quarter ways into the campaign against the second Lord Donna Beneviento, who lives inside this creepy old mansion with dolls lying all around the rooms, and not the good kind of dolls either. Stupid idiot! For this entire sequence you've got no weapons at all, and you're just running around trying to collect all of these items to get out of the house. They even slow down your movement speed during this bit as well, so you can't even run as fast as normal, and the second half of this section has you trying to avoid that giant fetus that can gobble you up if you get too close. <gasps> oh, shit! And again, this is all fine and dandy the first time you experience it, but the more you go back to this area, the slower and more tedious it starts to become. For my second playthrough, I was already dreading having to replay it, because I knew it was just going to be this 20 minute long side piece that was just going to drag down my whole momentum. The boss fight against Donna isn't even a boss fight. You simply run around the house looking for her doll, interact with it, and then watch an unskippable exchange while Ethan eventually stabs it in the head with a pair of scissors. Do this a few times and then Ethan's gonna finally finish it off. What? Why? You know, I've pretty much come to expect mediocre boss fights in this series at this point, even since the original games. There's never been much more to it than just running around and avoiding these blatantly telegraphed attacks that hit you like a goddamn freight train along with pumping round after round of your best guns into the boss's weak spots. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the vast majority of Resident Evil bosses can be broken down into mechanics like this. The fight against Lady D and Moreau definitely fall into this category. Heisenberg's does as well, but it also feels like something out of an entirely different game. It's kind of like you're playing a video game adaptation of Robot Wars. But still, it's mostly just about running around and shooting it as much as possible. Oh, don't give up. But look, if you gave me the option of an actual boss fight like that versus running around three or four rooms and pressing the interact button on something, well, I'll tell you, I'll take the spongy boss fights over the button prompt time and time again. <laughs> This is also the kind of dilemma you're going to face when you've got these four different bosses, each with vastly different areas and approaches to combat. When you swap them up so much in tone, it starts to make sense how people might like or dislike each of these so differently. If you loved Lady D's castle, well, that's not to say you're also going to love Donna's mansion or Heisenberg's factory, and that's perfectly understandable. And I think one of the main reasons we're seeing such a polarizing response over these characters. Fuck you, you crazy bitch! Another thing I couldn't really mention in my original video was the puzzles, although I really struggled to call them that. And yeah, the reason you can't talk about these was that they don't want people to give away the solutions, which is such a joke. Because I don't think any of the puzzles in this game are the kind of thing you're going to be spending more than a couple of minutes figuring out. And almost all of them just involve picking an item up, then bringing it somewhere else and activating it. I mean, that's not a puzzle, that's a fetch quest. That's about as much as a puzzle as it is picking up a red keycard in Doom and then bringing it to the red keycard door. I mean, check this one out at the start of the game, where you got to spin around these dials to make them match up with this sculpture. What about this one, where you've got to shoot these braziers so they light up these torches? Yeah, what an absolute brain buster. One of the rooms you need to get through requires shooting five different bells to unlock a hidden passageway, and this isn't a puzzle either. It's almost like the aiming test you do in a tutorial mission, before the game asks you if you want to turn on inverted aiming. This piano one doesn't even require being able to read sheet music because you can just press the buttons at random until you find the right notes. It even lights up when you've hit a correct key. During Heisenberg's factory, you've got to find all of these molds to make keys and cogs, and at one point, the place you need to use one of these is a stone's throw from the machine itself. Jesus. The entire sequence in Donna's mansion is probably, I think, the closest thing to a proper puzzle sequence in the entire game. You've got to pull this mannequin apart and inspect all these items hidden inside to get the elevator working. You gotta program a little music box and put all of these film strips in the correct order, but again, it hardly requires Mensa grade intelligence. I'm not asking for something akin to the old fountain puzzle from RA3, but there really is a sense here of the game just not having much faith in its players, by including little more than just a basic item hunt in lieu of actual puzzles to figure out and solve. Remember those days when you had to keep a notepad handy so you could jot things down? Well, yeah, this ain't that. Even RE4, which I do think this game takes a lot of influence from, despite its more action-oriented gameplay, still had a few puzzle sections that would leave you stumped for 10 or so minutes until you figured out the solution. No thanks, bro. 
And there's never that sense of accomplishment here when you figure out the solution to some kind of confusing conundrum. Mostly because there's no confusing conundrums to begin with. Seems useful. Another big complaint I've heard and one that I do kind of wish I'd touched on in my other video is in regards to the FOV, which is pretty damn low, but I gotta say this is something I'm still kind of on the fence about. I mean, look, don't get me wrong, they really should include an FOV slider. It really is a no-brainer. I get motion sickness from a lot of low FOV games, so I know how much this sucks. Just put a slider in Capcom, keep people happy. It's not that hard. No thanks, bro. But also as someone who pretty much exclusively plays shooters on the PC, I can also understand the importance of a narrow FOV versus a wide one. A wide one, for instance, just outright gives you an advantage during certain games. It allows you to see more of your peripheral vision and it makes you aware of threats coming from the side you might not normally see. And that's why people playing competitive games always have this up as high as possible. I almost feel that for that reason is why they didn't include this with Village because it's almost that low on purpose to increase that sense of claustrophobia and limit your visibility. And if that's not what they were going for, then, well, shit, I mean, it's stupid as hell, but I do get the gist that it's more of a stylistic choice here. If you could play this game with a high FOV, turning your view into a goddamn fisheye lens, well, then the tension and fear of wondering where things were coming from would just be completely gone. For PC players, it took them barely a couple of hours to mod this and make it wider. So if you're a PC player, there is light at the end of this tunnel vision tunnel. It looks pretty rough down there. But by far the worst part of the game though, and the one that I couldn't talk about at all in my original video, because it is a pretty huge spoiler, is the whole playable sequence as Chris Redfield. You know, I'd really hope going into this thing that they were going to pull a Metal Gear Solid 2. You know what I mean? You'd play as Ethan for a little bit, and then something would happen, it'd swap over to Chris, and he'd finish the whole thing off. Ethan. No. There's even a few points in the game where Ethan gets incredibly fucked up and I almost expected him to die, but of course being the absolute Chad that he is, he just keeps coming back. Ethan's kinda like the Rocky Balboa of survival horror protagonist. You can knock the guy down and hit him as much as you want, but he's just gonna keep on coming. What the fuck was that? The marketing's also a little bit misleading here. The official poster for the game shows a lichen with Chris's face superimposed over the top, which to me told me a couple of things. First off, that the game has werewolves, and secondly, that Chris is gonna be in it, and it's also highly likely that we're gonna play as him. All right, Ethan. All right. Now, I was correct on both fronts, it's just I didn't know it only plays him for such a short period of time. Right, so near the end of the game, you take over as Chris, and he starts launching a full-scale attack on the village. And this whole sequence is just fucking terrible. You just move through the same environments you've already explored as Ethan, trying to clear a path to Miranda. You've got more assault rifle bullets than you'll ever possibly need, along with grenades, flashbangs, and a backup pistol. At one point, you've got to call down an airstrike on this huge mutated growth, not once, not twice, but thrice, all whilst gunning down never-ending waves of lichens. The final boss fight for this section is against an even more mutated version of the head werewolf guy in an arena that's the size of a goddamn jacuzzi. Only this time, his only weak spot is a growth on his back, and you still need to call down airstrikes on him another three or four times. Not so. And I don't even know if it's possible to avoid some of these guys' attacks. Chris just moves so slowly. I mean, I know the dude's a bit of a beefcake, but here, it's kind of like he's running around with shoes that are full of cement or something. I guess I owe you an explanation. But it almost doesn't matter, though, because you've got so many healing items, and Chris can tank so much damage that you can almost afford to take all these hits on the double chin. And then after that, that's it. One of the most popular characters in the franchise, a dude who made Boulder Punching cool again, comes and goes within the span of 15 to 20 minutes, in easily, I think, the worst sequence in the entire game. I stopped playing RE6 because of stuff like this, and I can tell you that I don't like seeing it in RE8. It sucks. Chris's assault rifle has all of these super cool attachments like a front grip and what looks like a red dot sight, and at this point, this guy's got more experience handling weapons than John Wick but for some reason the gunplay still has the same recoil and spread as all of the other weapons in the game anyway. So. Chris is also really done dirty in this thing too, man. I mean, he acts aloof and mysterious right from the get-go, giving Ethan very little information or even justification for his actions. You later find out, of course, that the Mia he murders in the prologue wasn't Mia at all, it was Miranda in disguise, and yet he chooses to not tell Ethan about any of this. I mean, it wouldn't be very good from a narrative perspective if they gave away the main reveal in the game's opening. I get it. But it is still something that doesn't make any sense. 
kind of reminds me of Laura Dern's character keeping strategic information from Finn in The Last Jedi. It's purposeful obfuscation for the sake of not giving away heavy plot points to the player, but from the perspective of just basic common sense, it's kind of stupid. It's like, imagine if I walked into your house and took a shit on your bed. You'd be mad at me, wouldn't you? But then, imagine that I wait until you got me into court, you filed charges against me, then I revealed that I only took a shit on your bed because a bomb was inside the mattress. Why don't you fucking tell me right away? Like, why wouldn't I just tell you that after I took a shit on your bed? Or better yet, don't take a shit at all and just tell you about the bomb to begin with. See my point? Stupid idiot! It all culminates when Chris doesn't even tell Ethan about his whole grand plan to attack the village, which results in Ethan's death, because understandably he rushes off to do his own thing and save his daughter without any backup. At one point, even one of the side characters calls Chris out for this, and it does put one of Resident Evil's poster boys into a bit of a negative light. I don't know, man, he's just a bit of a dick. I know it's too late now, but we really should have told Ethan the plan. Oh well, at least we've still got best boy Leon. No thanks, bro. Overall though, I don't consider these game-breaking faults, but like I said earlier, they are the minor things that really prevent Village from going down as one of the best games in the series. Uh, there's more? If you only intend to play through this thing maybe once or twice, then most of this stuff probably won't even matter anyway. And the general response to this does seem to be pretty positive, judging off the reception it's gotten from people whose parents actually love them. Oh, you can't be serious! I still think it does so many things well to be written off by a few minor things. Is that all? Lady D really steals the show here, which makes her early demise even more upsetting. She'll undoubtedly go down in history as one of the series' most memorable villains, and her legacy is gonna live on for years in the countless amount of nude mods that people are gonna make for her too. You ungrateful, selfish, Rich. The setting is one of the most unique in the franchise to date, and it's left the storyline wide open as well with its sequel potential. I can show you things even Chris doesn't know I can do. At a time when most AAA games are coming out that are 80% finished, with the final 20% being completed over the ensuing months, for a game like Village to come out that's pretty much entirely finished and polished from the get-go, it just makes for such a welcome change. And if nothing else, it's going to be a nice distraction while we all wait for Resident Evil 4 VR, because let's be honest, that's the real shit right there. Ah! I just can't help myself. <laughs>